I am so happy that Andre and Ruth and my wife are back this week. For those of you who saw me running around last week, looking like I didn't know what I was doing, that was absolutely true. That was a good analysis. I am lost without this team. And I am so thankful that, that um, there's been many others that have been added to the team. Uh, so Fred and Maria and all of the, the servant leaders, I'm so thankful for all of you. And um, it's so great to, to be able to come in and just delegate. And even this morning, I don't know if you noticed, I was trying to butt my way into managing the chair situation. And uh, I didn't need to, which was so, I, so my apologies. I'm doing, I'm, I'm growing as a leader, learning to, uh, to delegate and, uh, and trust one another. And I think that's something that the Lord is, is really is doing with us as a congregation. So I'm excited about today. Uh, we're going to uh, have um, uh, a time of celebration. This is now Sukkot. So, Chag uh, Sukkot Sameach. Can you all say this together? Chag Sukkot Sameach. So happy, happy uh, Feast of Booths. Have a wonderful Feast of Booths. This is a, a time of celebration. It is called the Feast in the scriptures, the feast. So if you ever see uh, a passage and it says they went it was, uh, during the feast, this was known as the feast. Eight full days of partying. And yes, that is God's idea. God commanded us to rejoice during this time. So I'm going to start with a couple of traditional blessings or, or not so traditional blessings, but uh, really a, a prayer of thanking God for this season. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natan lanu chalkim chukot umoadim lasimcha lechavod Yeshua Hamashiach Adonai or haolam. Let's all say this together. <laughs> Not the Hebrew. We'll get to the next one. You can say the Hebrew. Those of you know Hebrew, you can read it off the top. So let's say the English together. We're working on it. We're getting to the next slide. It's just, there's a, this is good. So um, I will say this one and then you can say the next one. So it's bless you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us holidays, customs and seasons of happiness, for the glory of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, Light of the world. Amen. Amen. Now, how many have built your sukkah this year? How many know what a sukkah is? How many don't know what a sukkah is? Oh, everybody knows what a sukkah is? Okay. So a sukkah, you too! Yes! So a sukkah is a temporary booth. Uh, for those online, um, it's, it's just a temporary dwelling. And the Lord said, you're going to live in booths for one week. Uh, because we want you to remember the time when you lived in booths for 40 years in the wilderness where the Lord provided everything. And so there's a special prayer for the sukkah. So um, I, I'll say it to you. You can memorize this. That way when you build your sukkah, you can go home and say it, you know, your sukkah. I, you know what? It's tradition. So we'll just... Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher kitshavu b'mitzvotav b'tzivanu l'shev basuka. Now you'll notice that it all sounds very similar. So the first part of the prayer is the same. Let's say it together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with His commandments and has commanded us to dwell in the sukkah. So the shev is to dwell or to sit. So um, for those of you who are coming over to our house later, you'll get to sit under the sukkah. All right, let's go into the Word of God. Now, I, um, I did used to have lots of verses and tiny little words up on the screen, but for the sake of the people way at the back, I just deleted them all. So I figured you can bring your Bibles and read this, or you can write down the passages and read them later. Or you can go onto YouTube or Facebook and you can just freeze it and say, okay, there they are, print, print screen. But let's start in Leviticus chapter 23. If you're wondering where the feasts of Adonai are listed, Leviticus 23 is a great place to go. 
gives a synopsis of every single one. So Leviticus chapter 23, verse 42. And it says this. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. All the native born in Israel are to live in Sukkot. So that your generations may know that I had Bnei Israel in Sukkot when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. All right, so we are commanded to dwell, to dwell in Sukkot or tabernacles, to dwell in tabernacles, temporary dwellings. The second thing that we see, so this is called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also a time of physical harvest. I know that we're here on the Southern Hemisphere and we're just planting our uh, gardens. How many of you have planted your garden? We, uh, we finally got a garden started. You got a garden planted? Yes. So we're going to have some yummy veggies and we decided to plant only stuff we like to eat. What's the point of planting stuff we don't, except for bok choy. The, uh, we like bok choy. Who else in our family likes bok choy? One! Oh, who else here likes bok choy? Okay, see, I love bok choy. But we have four kids, three kids who don't. So, um, but it is a time of physical harvest in the Northern Hemisphere. I don't like that either. You don't like it either? Yeah, that's okay. You get along well with most of my kids, so that's okay. So it's a time, let's see, in Exodus chapter 23. This is another place where the Lord is bringing this up. Exodus 23. And I feel really strange standing up here on the stage. It's just very interesting for me. So forgive me if I feel a little awkward. It's okay. <laughs> Exodus 23, starting at verse 16. It says this. Also, you are to observe the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors that are sown in the field, as well as the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather your crops from the field. So this is not the feast of first harvest, this is the feast of ingathering. This is at the end of the growing season. This is in the autumn, right? In the Northern Hemisphere, they're in the middle of autumn or fall, if you're in the States. And um, there is that final ingathering, the ingathering of all of the, all of the produce that is grown and now is ready to come in. And so this is the time of physical harvest. But Yeshua always took physical principles and, all, and applied them to spiritual realities. So in Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11 verse 25, it says this. Yeah, that's good. I have a big one because I have a hard time reading it. All right, so Romans 11, chapter 25, or verse 25, says, For I do not want you, brothers and sisters, to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you become wise in your own eyes, that a partial pardoning has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer shall come out of Zion, and he shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and my covenant with them, and when I take away their sins. There is this prophecy in, in Isaiah, or in, in Ezekiel, and in Zechariah, and in many other places, but Paul is referring to it here, and he says, I don't want you to get proud and arrogant, thinking that, oh, it's so hard in, in Jewish evangelism. We, we see so few Jewish people come to the saving knowledge of Yeshua as the Messiah. I don't want you to get proud and say, oh, well, you know, maybe it's just not for them. Or maybe they have another way. Or, you know, well, God's ignored them and has replaced them with Israel. I don't want you to think that. No, there's a partial pardoning. Because remember, Paul's the one writing this. And he's an Orthodox Jew of the what would be a model of the party of the modern day rabbis, the, the, the Purushim, the, the Pharisees. And he was high up in the Pharisees. He'd been in their school, in under the school under Gamaliel, the school of Hillel, for years. And he says a partial hardening has happened. Not a total hardening. But there's a time when the ingathering of the Gentiles is complete. 
that all of Israel will be saved. And God is waiting for that time. I might suggest that we're getting very close to that time. But it's a time of spiritual harvest as well. We also see in, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 14, that this is supposed to be a season of rejoicing. It says, so you will rejoice in your feast. You, your son, your daughter, slave and maid, Levite and outsider, orphan and widow within your gates. Seven days you will feast Adonai your God in the place that he chooses, because Adonai, Adonai your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hand, and you will be completely filled with joy. You'll be completely filled with joy. And he goes on to say that it's, this is one of the times when all of Israel, if you could travel, you were supposed to go to Jerusalem and party for a week and celebrate and bring, bring sacrifices, bring offerings, bring money if you couldn't carry all the, the sheep with you, but just to come and celebrate and rejoice. Because this is the feast of Adonai. As the passage goes on, it says... That they, as, I, as I read, it says that uh, three times, all, like I said, all, uh, three times a year, all your males are to appear before Adonai your God in the place that he chooses, at the Feast of Matzah, at the Feast of Shavuot, and at the Feast of Sukkot. No one should appear before Adonai empty-handed. The gift of each man's hand, according to the blessing Adonai your God has given you. And this was called the Feast of Adonai. Sometimes uh, these are called the Feast of the Jews, and that's actually not accurate. You'll never find that term in Scripture. These are not the appointed times of the Jewish people. No, these are the appointed times of Adonai. It's like God has got a big permanent marker and drawn a circle around it and said, These are my days. These are the days to meet with you. Yes with me at other times, that's fine, but these are the times I have scheduled to meet with you. And I always, when I'm looking at world events, and this is a kind of a rabbit trail as we go on to the next slide, but when I look at I notice a lot happens around the feast days. There seems to be long times of nothing happening politically, it's like there's a quiet, a lull, but then all of a sudden you get to this time of the feast days and the entire world just stirs up. Sometimes it's an election, sometimes it's, it's, it's a conflict, sometimes it's, who knows, wars, rumors of wars, anything. But I notice a stirring. It's like the devil knows the Bible better than most people. And I think that that's the truth. He doesn't believe or believe it's true. He had longer to study. Yes, he has had longer to study, that's true. He's been around longer and he's trying to figure out how he can break God's word. But God's word will be seen to be true. The feast of Sukkot was also a time when the presence of God came in a very manifest way throughout history. In the first temple, we can turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8, we're talking about how Solomon built the temple after he, he spent seven years building the temple, using all the supplies that his father David had acquired, all the gold, silver, and, and precious stones, all the, all the brass and bronze and everything that he used. I think bronze is an anachronistic thing, but all the bronze and bro whatever it was, whichever. But he used all those things that he had acquired from around the nations and he saved them up for Solomon to build the temple. And Solomon went as his first task and he built this amazing temple. And you can see a little picture here. This is just a, an artist's rendition of it. You can see the massive sea that was built out of so much brass that they could not count how heavy it was. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10, now why do I read this passage? Well, because 1 Kings chapter 8, if you start reading the first part of the chapter, it says that they were meeting in the seventh month. That's now. At the feast in the seventh month. That would be today. And so then it is on this day that Solomon dedicated the temple. And it says, Now when the Kohanim came out of the holy place, 
The cloud filled the house of Adonai, so that the Kohanim could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Adonai filled the house of Adonai. Then Solomon smoke, spoke. Adonai said that he would dwell in the thick cloud. I have surely built you a magnificent house, a place for your dwelling forever. And here we see that the presence of God came in such a thick cloud that the priests could not stand. If you've ever wondered what if being slain in the spirit is in the Bible, there it is. And I know that that may shake some of your theology, but trust me, this is not the only place. When the spirit of God comes and the weight of his glory comes in such a strong way that you cannot stand up. But it didn't just happen in the first temple. It also happened in the second temple. What's interesting about the second temple is we know that it was built, obviously, it started with being built by um, Nehemiah and with Ezra there, and, and during that time after they'd come back from the battle. Yet, to our knowledge, it, the Ark of the Covenant was lost. Some people say that they may have found it. That's, uh, that's only a rumor. There's been no substantial proof of that. But there's no mention of it throughout any of the writings during that time. And there's no mention of this, the, the cloud of God's presence coming into that second temple until Yeshua. Because there was a prophecy that said that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And yet without the Ark of the Covenant, how was that possible? Well, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says this. This Son, talking of Yeshua, this Son is the radiance of His glory and the imprint of His being, upholding all things by His powerful Word. When He has made and when he had made purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Yeshua is the very glory of God in personal form. And it was in the second temple that he was dedicated on the eighth day, circumcised the eighth day. It was in this temple that he was that he was dedicated as, or had what at that time, similar to a bar bat mitzvah, if you remember at age 12, he was there discussing in the house the word of God with the, the learned teachers. And it was in this house that Yeshua made several declarations. Let's turn over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John, the closest of the disciples to Yeshua, said this. He says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, he was full of grace and truth. He is the glory of the Father and he is the word made flesh who has dwelt among us, who has tabernacled among us. Let's go to the next slide. The Ushpazim. Ushpazim means the holy guests or guests to have. It is, a, it is honorable to, to have somebody, a, a visitor, come and dwell in your sukkah, to, to hang out with each other. There's actually a, a movie by, by that title. So if you've seen it, it's, it's quite funny. Uh, it's a uh, Hebrew with English subtitles called Ushpazim. But let me tell you that there was an amazing visitor who spent a night in a sukkah. I'm going to read a passage from Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. This is not the passage you may be thinking I'm going to. Let's see. Matthew 17. It says, after six days, Yeshua takes with him Peter and Jacob and John, his brother, and brings him up onto a high mountain by themselves. Now he was transfigured before them. 
His face shone like the sun. His clothes were like Elijah appeared to with Yeshua. And Peter responded to Yeshua, Master, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three Sukkot here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. But when the disciples heard this, they fell face down, terrified. But Yeshua came and touched them. Get up, he said, stop being afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Yeshua alone. You see, Peter's first response when he saw these guests, and he recognized them as Moses and Elijah, and he saw Yeshua transfigured into his glorious form. He said, let's build three Sukkot. Let's hang out here. This is great. Let's dwell here. Let's stay in this place. Yeshua is that holy guest who came to dwell with us. Let's turn over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. All right. This is Yeshua at Sukkot. And I'll start at verse 37. But I encourage you to read this whole passage. We see that Yeshua personifies a lot of the things that were going on. There was this water drawing ceremony that was a part of Sukkot. They would actually go down to um, go down and get some fresh living water, and then you know the priests would go down and they would bring it up and they would pour it out as a drip offering, as a water offering to the Lord every day for the seven days. And on the last day, they would do it seven times because you know if uh, if that was good enough for for uh, uh, what. Jericho, that's right, if it was good enough for Joshua and Jericho, hey, it's good enough for here. But they would grab that water seven times and it would get build that excitement through that time. And it was at this time that John says, in verse 37, he says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Yeshua stood up and cried out loudly, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his inmost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Ruach, whom those who trusted in him were going to receive. For the Ruach had not been given since Yeshua had not yet been glorified. There was also, on, during this feast of Sukkot, they would light these massive lanterns in the, in the, the temple. I've, I've just found a, a, a picture from YouTube as an example. Well, not YouTube, but from the internet. But um, you can see over there's these massive lanterns. And these lanterns were, were like 12 feet tall. They were tall and had huge, you know, oil lanterns. And it says, it said in some of them that the light of it would literally light up the entire hillside all around Jerusalem. How many of you have been to Jerusalem, been up to the Mount of Olives, and you can look down onto the temple, so that light would have shone all the way up there to the Mount of Olives. And it was at this time, the same, the same period, the next chapter over, John chapter 8 verse 12, where Yeshua then turns around and says, Yeshua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And there's a whole discussion around that, but here he is with the backdrop of these massive torches, just lighting up the entire hillside. And he declares, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. I want to go to the next one and we'll be going through this passage as we will be starting well starting we'll be continuing on into the book of revelation next week 
So we'll be going in and doing our, doing our own little intro. How many enjoyed having Dr. Ashley Crane? It was such a, a blessing to listen to him. And, and uh, so that gives a really good overview, but we're going to now go through it Me. nice and slowly. What's up, buddy? Me. Yeah, you enjoyed it? Good. So Revelation chapter 21 actually also talks about Sukkot. So Revelation 21. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And as we read this, think about it in the context of Sukkot. This is just an interesting picture I got from a Catholic website of some artist's rendition of John and his vision of the new Jerusalem. And it says here in Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I also heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he shall tabernacle among them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them and be their God. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Nor shall there be any mourning or crying or pain any longer, for the former things have passed away. This is the ultimate desire of Adonai, is to tabernacle among us. This is what was lost in the Garden of Eden, and this is what the end of Revelation discloses to us. That the goal of God and everything that He has done is to bring us back to Himself and Himself to us that He might tabernacle with us. That He might dwell with us. Alright, how many know what this is? <clears throat> so this is a makeshift COVID-19 lula. That's right. This is a, we'll follow the scriptures and do what the Bible says sort of lula. And uh, we'll go with what we have on hand. So, Arba'at Haminim, the four species. Four species. Now, where do, where do we get this? Let's go to the next one. So, four species. It's actually a biblical tradition, not, not a rabbinic one. So, in Leviticus 23, verse 40, it says, On the first day you are to take choice fruit of trees, branches of a palm tree, Boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and rejoice before Adonai your God seven days. So, we were able to get uh, some lovely palm branches. Uh, they're not date palms, but they are palm branches from the local uh, florist. So, thank you so much uh, for that. And we were also, since we live next to a brook, there were willows. We found some willows, but we weren't able to find chasadim or myrtles. Uh, that was not one that we found. So we found something that was pretty close. I guess the Australian version of Myrtle. Wattle! There we go. We'll go with Wattle. Now, um, the good news is on the Etrog. So Etrog is a citrus fruit that is very bumpy, much more bumpy than this one. But the good thing is, is the scripture doesn't actually say Etrog. It says a choice fruit of the trees. So this was our choice for the fruit of the trees. Yeah, and it's a nice, nice lemon that's also a citrus. Good choice. Yeah, good choice. Thank you, thank you. You got my joke. My dad jokes. Where, where did we come? This one came from, uh, I think from Woolies. So we got this one from Woolies, but it did come from a tree originally. Oh, I'm going to find it. Yeah, so we're actually looking at it in Leviticus, but we're going to go over to uh, Psalm chapter 118. Oh, good, because you might need it to look at Psalm 118. So we're going to do a special prayer over the lulav. This is just a traditional prayer. You ready to pray? All right. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kishanu bemitzvotam vitzivanu al nitilat lulav. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and has commanded us with regards to the Lula, which he has. Amen. Amen. 
All right, so I'm going to need your help. Which way is north? Does anybody know which way is north? That way? Okay, good. So I'm going to have to work on my directions. Yes, let's all go ahead and stand up. So this is just, uh, this is all from Psalm 118. And uh, I'm going to go and face the directions. Thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His loving kindness endures forever. All right. Yomarna Yisrael ki le'elam chasto. His loving kindness endures forever. All right. Now, which way is east? But well, that way is north. East has got to be that way, right? Yomru hanabat aron ki le'elam chasto. Alright, this is awkward. Here we go. Robert? Yep, you're gonna help me. You're gonna face this way. It's called a lula. You can help me in just a minute. Alright. It says, Yomruna Yere Adonai, Kile Lam Hasto. Ana Adonai Hoshiana. Adonai Sayana, please teach you. Ana Adonai Hatslichana. Adonai, rescue us now. Amen. Amen. So, Saul, if you want to come up here, and you can help wave this for me while, while we read the rest, okay? Okay, would you like to put your Bible up here? There we go. That's actually in my little Bible. All right, yeah, that in that hand, and that in that hand. Okay, so as we say this, you just get to shake it, okay? All right, so let's go on. Out of a tight place, I called on Adonai. Adonai answered me with a spacious place. Adonai is for me. Adonai is for me as my helper. I will see the downfall of those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in Adonai than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in Adonai than to trust in princes. In the name of Adonai, cut them off. They surrounded me, yes, all around me. In the name of Adonai, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like they were extinguished by burning thorns. In the name of Adonai, I cut them off. You put Adonai helped me. Adonai is my son. He has become my salvation. My Yeshua, Yeshua team. Shouts of joy and victory are in the tents of the righteous. Adonai's right hand is mighty. Adonai's right hand is lifted high. Adonai's right hand is mighty. I will not die but live. And has me hard, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and praise Adonai. This is the gate of Adonai. The righteous will enter through it. I give thanks because you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. It is from Adonai. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that Adonai has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hoshiana, please, Adonai, save now. We beseech you, Adonai, prosper us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. We bless you from the house of Adonai. Adonai is God, and he has given us light. 
Join the festival with branches up to the horn of the altar. You are my God, and I praise you. You are my God, I exalt you. Give thanks to Adonai, for he is good, for his endures forever. Amen. And one final scripture and we'll close with this. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Adonai is my strength and son. He has also become my salvation. With joy he will draw water from the wells of salvation. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Can I hang on to that? All right. Oh, I need to get this thing. Well, that's a good question. So, if why did we get a plant? That's a great question. And you're all welcome to be seated. Uh, what time is it? I forget my watch. We need your 11 We've got 11.20. Great. We've got a bit of time for questions. And we're going to, Ellie's going to come up and do some announcements. So the first question was from Saul, and he says, why did you get a plant? Well, God actually said in the Bible, when it's this time for the feast, you're supposed to get a plant and it's supposed to wave. So it's oh, just a way of saying, yay, we're celebrating. And we're praying for rain. And we're praying for rain as well. And we're thanking God for the harvest as well. Why did you guys just go, why did you guys go to Oh, this one? Or this one? Oh, so we had to go all over town to get this one. So this one's from right near our house. This one was from in Canberra. And I think this one was from near our house. And then this one was at Woolies or IGA. I'm not sure. At yeah, the shop. So, all right. Some announcements? All right. So next week, um, because it's a week long, um, for those of you who can't come to our house today because it was capped at 20 because of COVID, sorry. Um, we will have a celebration for the last great day at the park, um, Franklin um, Recreational Park, and everyone can come to that. Um, and then also, um, just want to give you a heads up, we will take an offering for One for Israel. They do so many um, uh, videos online uh, spreading um, the gospel in Hebrew to all of Israel, and with Israel being in lockdown, more people are going to be on the internet more than ever before, and they're already on YouTube the most out of all people in the world per capita anyway. Um, and so um, we would like to give an offering to help further the gospel with them. And so the scripture it says, don't come up um, to the feast of Passover or Pentecost or uh, Sukkot empty-handed. This is an opportunity for you to give a love offering to one for Israel. We'll gather it and, and then send it to them next week. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, and also we'll be bringing our portable sukkah, because they're all portable. Uh, so we'll be bringing it and setting it up there. So um, we'll... Uh, and food. And food. Yes, and food. It's supposed to be a rejoicing. So, uh, yes, Lord willing, just a minute. Lord willing, there are restriction changes or changes in the restrictions that are supposed to be coming down the pipe soon. I've heard that possibly by next week they may go to the next phase or whatever that's supposed to be. So Lord willing, we'll find out and be able to, I don't know what we'll be able to do. So we'll find out then, I guess. So um, any other announcements? No, there's a question. Yes, um, the passage in Matthew about the transfiguration of Jesus. Um, if you look at the transfiguration of Jesus, that's correct. It doesn't say so. The, the passage, you're correct. The, the passage in Matthew with Yeshua on the Mount of Transfiguration, it doesn't link it with Sukkot, except for the place where Peter automatically assumed, hey, the presence of God has come. Let's build some sukkahs. Let's dwell here. So there was this there was this link between when God's presence comes in a very manifest physical way, like the glory cloud or, you know, just the, the presence of God, then it must be a time to party and celebrate and, and dwell. And so there was always a link between that and between that and Sukkot, of God's presence dwelling with us. So you're correct. There's nothing in that passage that points to the timing being at Sukkot. In fact, it probably wasn't because Yeshua always made sure he went to Jerusalem during Sukkot. Um, it was one of those three pilgrimage feasts, feasts where God says, if you're a man, you got to be there. 
Uh, if you're an AD, you, you get to get off if you want to, or you get to come along for the fun. So it was, uh, it was your choice. But um, So Jesus would have been in Jerusalem at the time of Sukkot, but, so it's probably not at that time. But the link is in the presence of God and in the glory of God. Did you have another question there? No? Okay. Can I get you to do something for me? You do? All right. Any other questions before we close out? Yes, yeah, go for it. Uh, the, uh, the picture of the tip, first temple had the lava. The lava? Yeah. Lava. Yeah. What about in the tabernacle time did they have? So they did have a lava, but it was not nearly that big because it had to be portable. So um, when they built the lava, it would have probably only been about yay big um, because and it had rings in it where they could put the poles in. So there's some specific dimensions that you'll find out in, in Exodus where we, uh, Adonai gives Moses the, the examples and he tells you how many cubits so you can get an idea. I'm not exactly sure but from what I remember it was approximately this big. Uh, it did have water so there was a lot of washing of the hands of course because um, giving sacrifices to the Lord was very messy or it could be somewhat messy. They did it as clean as possible and as gentle as possible. But it was, it was a constant washing, uh, and that would, would have been replenished daily. So you're right, the, the temporary portable one is actually where Sukkot links to, because that was the tabernacle. It was deliberately the portable uh, presence of God, that God would go with it. And what's interesting about that one as well, so kind of a little rabbit trail, but if you remember, whenever the glory cloud came down, that's where they would set up tent. So they could build that portable sukkah, for God's presence, and then they build their own portable sukkahs. Now, I don't know if I don't have it in our picture. There's a, uh, a picture that I had last year, which just shows all of the tents of all the people and how they would have been arranged around the tabernacle. And so that is what Sukkot is supposed to remind us of. It's supposed to point us back to, ah, oh, look, we were in tabernacles, and oh yeah, by the way, God's presence was with us in a very tangible way. So, kind of. Answers your question, but it goes a little bit into something else. Oh, wait. Oh, okay, Yoko. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, connected our audience connection, but you related Leviticus 19 to four. It's a covenant of father. Does it sort of like prophecy towards God's dwelling? Which one is that? The one? So Revelation 21 is absolutely a prophecy. So is it a prophecy? Can you take it as a spot is prophesying Jesus is coming, second coming and new. So this is actually after the second coming. Revelation 21 is actually after yeah. the so second coming, because the second coming is in chapter 19. But what we see in Revelation 21 is this is after the thousand year millennial reign. So Yeshua reigns on earth, this yeah. earth, for a thousand years. And then at the end of that thousand years, there's this little blip of a battle, uh, Gog and Magog. And uh, then after that, John sees this uh, new heaven and new earth. And it has to be a new earth because the size of the new Jerusalem is so large that it would, you know, actually tilt the entire planet. <clears throat> Don't worry, God's got that covered. I'm pretty sure he understands how physics works. So, um, but the point is, is, this is this is beyond the thousand years. This is John looking way down in the future and seeing that there is going to come a time at the end of the story where God's presence will able, be able to dwell with man once again. And that will come when everything has been renewed from the heavens and the earth to the new Jerusalem, which is also called the Bride of Messiah, which we are all, I hope we are all a part of. How many of you are part of the Bride of Messiah? Great, great. And this one's for the ladies. How many of you are all sons of God? You should all raise your hands. <laughs> all right, so don't worry. It's, that's in God's you know, eternal plan. He's got that covered. But the new Jerusalem is us. It's a people that he's dwelling with. And um, of course, what makes a city? A city without people is nothing. Now, I saw another hand. Nothing? Okay. All right, well, then let's close with prayer. 
Abba Father, we are so thankful that your plan is to dwell with us. Lord, you have purposed in your hearts. Lord, you've, you've already set it out that this is what you are going to do. You are going to make these things happen. And Father, it is so easy for us to get distracted with all the things that are going on around us, whether it's the, the pandemic or, or uh, the, the restrictions or the government overreach or whatever it happens to be, Lord. Lord, it is so easy to be distracted by those things. But Father, I'm asking that we would have eyes to see your hand. What are you doing at this time? Lord, you are not afraid. You are not worried. That's something that I got from Ashley Crane's teaching last week. You are not worried. You sit in heavens and you laugh. Lord, you have everything under control, even though we do not. And so, Lord, we put our trust and our hope in you, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen and amen. We're going to close with the hour of benediction and then we'll go ahead and clean up. If you would all stand up, if you can stand. That's it. <laughs> The Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen and amen. Shabbat shalom, everyone. God bless you all.